One night, under cover of darkness, two men slipped into their neighbor's apple orchard and stole a whole bunch of apples. And they did this hurriedly, of course, and wanting to be fair, because after all, there is honor among thieves, they decided to seek out a secluded place where they could sit down and divide up their loot. And the place they found was behind a stone wall that encircled the local cemetery. So they sat down there and they began to divide up the apple, saying, I'll take this one, I'll take that one, I'll take this one, I'll take that one. And so it happened that at the same time, a man was walking down the road next to the cemetery and heard these voices coming over the wall saying, I'll take this one, I'll take that one, I'll take this one, I'll take that one. So he began to run as fast as he could to the village, and when he got there breathless, he caught every person that he could, and he said, judgment day has come. The devil and the Lord are out in the cemetery dividing up the folks. Friends, there are Christians whose beliefs about human beings are based upon the assumption that from the beginning of time, the devil and the Lord have divided up the folks. That from the foundation of the earth, God has intended to leave some people out, has intended to exclude some, saying, I'll take this one, but not that one. Some Christians' worldview is based upon this, that God intends that some be included and others excluded, that some be saved and others condemned. But you know, it seems to me that Jesus says something entirely different. Jesus says, what farmer having a hundred sheep and one gets lost will leave the 99 behind in the wilderness and go look for the one that is lost, look everywhere until he finds it. And what woman having 10 silver coins, if she drops one through the floorboards, will not light a lamp and sweep the floor and look everywhere she can until she finds it. Now, my colleague Bill Crouch rightly says that this text is so familiar to us, it's one of those we've heard so many times that we may fail to really take in what it means when we hear it, because it's just so easy to listen to these two parables and find ourselves nodding our heads. A hundred sheep, one is lost. I would go out and look for it until I find it, of course, leaving the other 99 behind. Yes, yes, of course I would do that. If I had 10 silver coins and I dropped one, well, I would do everything. I would tear up the carpet. I would get out a flashlight. I would do everything I had to do to find that one that is lost. But really, friends? Really? Because I have to tell you that that might not be my first inclination. Statistically speaking, the numbers that we're talking about are pretty good. 99 out of 100, 9 out of 10, a lot of us would be satisfied with that. My husband, for example, well, he, he played baseball into college, and he tells me that if a batter got a hit once out of every three times at bat, he'd make the all-star team. He'd be more than satisfied. Or if a student got 99 out of 100 on a test, they get an A+. Plus. You would think they'd be very satisfied with that. Well, friends, I... We might be satisfied with 9 out of 10, 99 out of 100, but not our God. Jesus says, there's 99 sheep in the fold and one is lost. God's going to go looking. You've got nine coins in hand and one has fallen underneath the carpet. God's going to go get the flashlight. You see, friends, we might be satisfied with those statistics. We might be satisfied to leave one out. But our God will never be satisfied as long as anyone is excluded. We are called as the church to be as proactively inclusive as God is. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had a name for this. He called it the beloved community. Dr. King said that in the beloved community, everyone has a place. Everyone is wanted. Everyone is invited. Everyone is appreciated. And everyone is bound by agape love. 
Dr. King said there are three kinds of love, you know. There's eros, which is romantic love, and then there's philia, which is the love between friends, and then there is agape, which is overflowing, redeeming goodwill, the kind of love that God has for human beings. Dr. King says that agape love does not begin with discriminating between who is worthy and who is unworthy, but instead begins by loving people for their sakes. Agape love creates and preserves community, the beloved community. No one left out. That's what the church is called to be, the beloved community like that. But friends, I, I know, I'm, I'm fully aware that in today's world, it seems more than ever, there are deep divisions between Christians regarding what church is really all about, what we're supposed to be doing together as the body of Christ. There are some Christians, for example, who see the church as the place where you get self-help tips. Uh, in former churches, I've actually had people say things to me like, well, if you are not going to preach a sermon series on how to be a better you, I'm not going to attend there. I'm not going to be part of church because otherwise it's just, you know, it's irrelevant to me. As if Christianity is a self-improvement program. There are others who see the church as a place to consume spiritual goods and services. And there are still others who see the church as a fortress, a place to retreat from the world. Now, those are very different ideas, but there is a thread of commonality that runs through them. Not a single one of them has anything to do with community. Instead, there seems to be a sort of turning inward, you know, sort of a, a, an obsession with self there to such an extent that it might be characterized as exclusivity. And friends, I can't find anywhere in the Gospels where Jesus talks about the body, talks about the church that way. Now, when church becomes all about me and what it can do for me, well, then it might be a coffee bar or a club or an entertainment venue or a place where scouts and rotary meet, but it's not church. When we are no longer interested in searching for those who are still out there and including them, we are no longer the church. Friends, we are called to be as proactively inclusive as God is, the beloved community. That's church. Now, I hope that you know that we are in the process of opening up our campus very gradually. During this time of global pandemic, our leadership has been very careful about this because we want to do no harm. That's our number one rule as Wesleyans. We care so much about the health and safety of all of you, of everyone in our community. So it's been a very gradual process, and that's been going well. And now I'm excited to tell you that this next week, those of you who are members of the church or long-term visitors who are in our database will get a letter from me telling you that we are preparing to resume public worship here at Alamo Heights United Methodist Church on June the 28th. Now, it will be limited, uh, and uh, definitely we'll have health and safety protocols in place, and we'll tell you all about those so you'll be prepared. But for those who are ready to come back, who feel comfortable coming back to worship here in the church building, we will be ready to receive you. But you know, in the midst of all of the excitement around that, I, I have to tell you, I've been especially grateful for the wise words of our bishop, Bishop Robert Schnazy of the Rio, Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church, because Bishop Schnazy has repeatedly said to us pastors, remember, this is not just a time of reopening. It's a restart. It's an opportunity 
a unique one given to the church, to embrace a new beginning. Friends, this is a time when we as a church can step back and ask ourselves, who are we? And what are we about as the body of Christ? What is our mission? Friends, what is our identity? And are we living into that? Our identity statement here at Alamo Heights United Methodist Church is that we're a Christian community of love, hope, and belonging for all. That begs the question, if we're saying all, who isn't here with us? Who is missing? Who is not yet included? And how can we reach them? Because, friends, I'm convinced with my whole heart that Christ is calling us to press even harder to be the inclusive body that God calls us to be, to reach out and include people in our fellowship. And if we are successful in that mission, if it bears fruit, well, you know then that the church will change. The church will change because when we're pressing hard to include, to make sure that we're reaching out as the beloved community to include people in agape love, well, that means that we're going to form new relationships and, and new people could come and be with us here. New people who look and think and act differently than perhaps some of the folks who are already members of this church. People who are perhaps ready to step into leadership. People who are ready to love and be loved. Now look, I know whenever we talk about change in the church, we can get that feeling that comes up in our chest, you know. We want to grow, we do, but change, sometimes that's very hard to embrace. Change, I mean, new people who might sit in our usual spot on Sunday morning, we might begin thinking, well, we really don't want things to change. New people can come, but they need to be exactly like us. We, we'd really prefer that our, our church just be a collection of our dearest friends. And I want you to know I understand that because I have spent my whole life in church and some of my very dearest friends have been members of my churches and I, I know how wonderful it is to come together and to be with those people we know so well and love so much, but oh my friends, there's always more love to go around. Agape love can expand indefinitely to include more and more people. I really cannot imagine a time, can you, when we, we really could feast on grace in this place and not, not reach out to those in our community who are so hungry for it. I don't think a time is going to come when Jesus will walk in the back door of our sanctuary, look around and say, you know what, I think you people are off the hook. It looks pretty full here. I'll go down the street. No, friends. We are called to be the beloved community. We are called to search out and include those who are not yet part of our fellowship. We are called to be that beloved community whose love, like God's, knows no bounds. I'll close with this. People close to me know that I'm sort of a museum geek museum nerd. I love museums, especially art museums. Anytime I go to a new city, if I have the time, I, I try to make it to the local art museum, and they never fail to impress. There are always so many things to see. I have lots of art books at home, and I guess you won't be surprised to find out that I especially love religious art, given that I'm kind of in the business, you know. Well, one of my very favorite religious paintings is called The Last Supper. It's by Salvador Dali. And we're putting up a picture right now of that painting for you to look at, and I hope that you will look at it very carefully. Now, at first glance, I know this looks like a rather mm, unorthodox representation of The Last Supper. But at the same time, all the basic elements are there. There's Jesus at the table. Do you see him? 
and the disciples gathered around, and, and before Jesus on the table is the bread that he has just consecrated as his body. But if you look closely at Christ, at the figure of Jesus, do you see something amazing is happening in the picture? Christ's body is becoming transparent. You can see through his chest and shoulder to the water and the boats behind him. Dolly is showing us that as we look at the world through Christ, we see it differently. And he's also showing Christ becoming the world. Friends, I believe that's God's dream. Christ is the world. The world as beloved community. Friends, no matter what anyone says, the devil and the Lord have not divided up the folks. Nine out of ten, 99 out of 100, in some instances, those are good statistics. We can be satisfied. But when it comes to our brothers and sisters, our God is not. Our God will never be satisfied as long as anyone is excluded. And as a beloved community, we cannot be either. Will you pray with me? Most loving God, we give you thanks for you call us into community with you and with one another and what a blessing that is. Open our hearts, O oh God, to share agape love with all we meet and include more and more in our fellowship that all may know your love and grace. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.